a simple conversation? Um, and is it even reasonable to measure someone? And, and, and you know, we can quant quantifiably or, you know, assess how well persons deal with the load, uh, how they react, the choices they make. Are they able to maintain productivity? Are they able to maintain rational choices and, you know, courses of action under duress? And that's just, you know, that is, is, is it right to measure someone like that? Uh, that's a, a, a reasonable question, but that measurement uh, is uh, obviously can be made. Yeah. So, I mean, I just, I started recording as you went into that wonderful speech about duress and, and I think just to, to provide context for, for welcome back, by the way, I think this is going to land up being a regular <clears throat> if, if, if the last five minutes were anything to go by, but welcome back, uh, Captain Rational, you legend. It's fucking awesome to have you with us today and um as usual it all happened on twitter and here we are and we kind of started the discussion you know like what does it all mean you know like why are we here and kind of like carrying this load and being under duress and and we're here and we're kind of ma making sense of it trying to work it all out and we've made reference to the matrix and you know the importance of like a buddhist perspective for a brief moment you know the whole point of of life is to be happy but the hard part is to figure out what makes us happy you know is it is it about money is it just about love is it just about hate what is it you know so i don't think we'll attempt to answer those questions today directly we i'm sure we'll delve into it but yeah it's good to be here with you guys those good are deep questions Pleasure. those are deep questions <clears throat> That's, I mean, isn't that what people expect from their crypto podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, dude. Answering life's deepest questions. Yeah, yeah I it's... think there was, there was one of the guys, one of the traders, um, I forget his name now, but he actually made a comment and he said, the market's going to take us into deep waters the deepest waters that will allow you to reflect on who you really are. Um, and it's so true, man. It's like, it really does. And it's kind of like why, you know, Noah was saying like, just I'm okay. I'm good. Everything's great. But she I feel like I'm carrying a load at the moment. So where is this load coming from gentlemen? <sighs> Bear market stuff. Although, I mean, to be honest, personally i found the bull market to be far more exhausting like yeah. i i've kind of given up on the price action right now so like uh i'm just kind of waiting i'm watching i'm i'm waiting for things to develop to the point where i feel like we have reached the bottom and when that happens then then I will, uh, I will be the deployer and then I'll be back to worried about price action. But like <clears throat> right now I'm just continuing to watch liquidity drain out of the system. Mm. That is an astute observation regarding the liquidity. Um, you know, my, a good part of the last couple of years, I've been trying to assess the most sustainable means of engaging with markets. And, you know, we'll hear time and time again, persons that are able to navigate, you know, persons that are quite, technically inclined or you know, astute with technical analysis, they'll say, why not capitalize on the volatility and uh, you know, unexpected price action? And um, I have stood firm in my, my belief that there are more sustainable ways. And, it does, and it's find, find your actor that has most impressed you. And, and that ultimately was Buffett for myself and you know it's completely separate and apart from his interest in the space it's irrelevant uh what's pertinent is how he behaves what he does why he does it how he does it he's methodical he's um an opportunist best capitalist or opportunist and he's cutthroat and he will buy blood and he's willing to to be wrong for years yeah. <laughs> years like I, I mean every time that 
everybody you, you'll see these like is this the next warren buffett is warren buffett washed up and then like you know that's about the time that you start seeing those articles that you need to start like selling everything into cash uh because like those are a pretty damn good top indicator when people start like you know calling they don't out understand him Warren Buffett is you buy something in 1990 and you check back in the 2000. Did it significantly <laughs> alter the state and directionality of a population? So that's not <laughs> people called. <It's>, <laughs> yeah, that is antithetical to the like high turnover uh, modern media like infrastructure. Like it just does not compute for them. Like they want gains like today for things you did yesterday. Not it's like, not Buffett. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. And it's, you know, it's hard to operate. Uh, I think a lot of people have trouble <clears throat> thinking on, on that sort of, uh, of time frame. But if you can continually do it, like it allows you to, I mean, at that point, it becomes less important to, to buy bottoms. Although when you're Warren Buffett size, like you just make the bottom. You don't. You That's just, different. No, yeah, he didn't start there. Yeah, no, he did not start there. But yeah. So size is a consideration. Entry is a consideration. Time horizon is a consideration. But what's most interesting is... Uh, is duration or is uh, the time horizon? Why? Because it's contrary to the uh, emotions. Emotions will not allow a person to see number go down. So there's few that have a capacity to not <laughs> liquidate under the extreme of duress. So that is really the, the power of the Buffett. But that's why... I believe the, they call it voter escrow, but what really is time locks? Now, Bitcoin has time locks as well, <laughs> straight on the, on, the, on the chain. But I think the notion of forced duration, forced time locks, is one of the most interesting creations in the entire space. Forced duration. You don't even have forced duration with sovereign bonds. You can sell the bond. This has, that is a, an innovation that never existed. No such thing as forced duration in traditional finance. That's an interesting point. I mean, I think there's still a lot of um, design space to explore with duration in crypto because so much of it is like, um, you know, like lending and borrowing. Like there's no duration attached to it. It's not like if you don't pay within three months, you get liquidated sort of a thing. Uh, I think there's some like interesting things that could happen in that that particular area of design because like I think from a risk management perspective I think that's what makes crypto so difficult is that there's no easy way to plan from a duration perspective because so many of the loans are just perpetual so much of the leverage is perpetual and it's like it makes it very difficult to actually manage risk in this environment and i think that like when we get to a place of greater sophistication we will have better tools for uh managing risk but it's quite reasonable where we're in, this is barely the infancy um the pros professionals at carry trades that handle bond market activities they're like all right this is pretty much the same uh, there's some innovative flows features characteristics to these types of markets um, so we are just starting because um, the like the general public is over the last couple of years or the last decade maybe has begun speculating aggressively in equity so that's all they know how to do in in the crypto market so i you know i don't know the full directionality of the entire space because the whole landscape is always changing is it just the speculators that drive the market or is it 
the seasoned professional that has a capacity to navigate these sophisticated systems. Um, you know, trying to prognosticate directionality is is quite a burden, as we were talking about burdens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like without all these like various like risk management tools and stuff, like I do feel like the crypto space feels very foreign to many TradFi people. Like it, it, it's like, it's kind of like you just landed in like Dr. Seuss land and you're, you're not <laughs> quite sure. Like it sort of looks like a tree, but it's got a, you know, like <laughs> pink stuff coming out of it. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's, it's crazy how like these, a lot of these things resemble things that are in TradFi but there's, there's so many pieces, parts that are missing. There's, there's like the ability to like bet, like on the interest rate risk between one month and three months forward. Like how, how do you do that in the crypto space? Like you, you, you can't, there's no tools available to do that sort of like investment. And that's, that's what these people know. And so it's like, it, it's like this cartoonish wild space that, I mean, yes, yeah, speculators mostly drive it because like traditional risk management just doesn't work in this space. And it, you know, it makes it wildly interesting though, because everybody is grappling with playing this game according to the tools that are in play at this time. True. That's and well so <clears throat> it's, <laughs> It's just very challenging and everybody's sort of like feeling it out on their own. And so if you can actually like think about this stuff using first principles and like reason out like the best way to, to play the game at as, as it is currently written, you can outplay these TradFi people that know, you know, TradFi systems inside and out. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean... I That's think well there's, said. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of tradfi people that I've I've heard interviews of that just completely misunderstand the space and how it works. Well, bear in mind, like traditional finance, and especially persons that opt into d detraction, you know they they shoot it down. What, what's what's occurring? What's being built? And they say it because you could do all this shit in TradFi, which is a classical argument. Every time an innovative technology or a new technology is created, uh, um, you know, who uses email when you have the facts? It's the traditional yep. argument. Yep. So, and and that takes the that takes a fair amount of time to play out because obviously. Um, telephone deprecates the previous technology, so on and so forth, and we see it time and time again. And that's, um, you know, the exponential age that Brow talks about and everything, uh, adoption curves, so on and so forth. Um, so what's pertinent is, um, is what it offers, and it's peering through the madness. It's a concept I, I often talk about. And permissionlessness, and, and instead of focusing on the specific systems that have a capacity to attract different actors to engage in the space, the true innovation is that it's decentralized, so it has that uncensorability. And, and people drift away uh, from the narratives that count. I mean, maybe Bitcoiners do really uh, just hammer home the most important things to talk about is decentralization but there's a degree of decentralization with ethereum and even the other chains and they're, 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 yes. and they're not taken down it's not like they're dropping like flies they offer a functionality they have degrees of decentralization they all have permissionlessness and the argument um is that they'll be shut down but they're not shut down so that means things will progress. Things will keep going. Innovation will continue from a platform perspective. And clearly there's risks. And, oh, okay, TradFi is not accustomed to dealing with the risk of a system actually working out as intended. Okay, so 
where where is the options market for avalanche being turned off by the federal government? So there's there's risks yeah. everywhere. It's the nature of humanity to assess the potential risks of everything. <clears throat> Indeed. So what I find really interesting about the discussion that's voluntarily and spontaneously gravitated towards is that we started out in crypto with probably one of the greatest things that that has ever been created from a I mean from decentralization from I mean all those qualities that that, that the maxis for the most part have a hundred percent you know justification promoting and, and raving about and so we've got that and then instead what we did with it is that we we came up with all these crazy ideas that completely and utterly detracted from kind of what it should have originally been directed towards and that was to challenge what TradFi was about but instead we went for all these crazy like so-called innovative approaches I mean, and we had, we've obviously had our different cycles where the first one was all about Bitcoin, the second one was all about IPOs, and then the last one was all about Ponzi's. Sure, we've learned a lot of lessons along the way, like very valuable lessons. But what's interesting about the lessons that we've learned from my perspective, and I'd, I'd really like to hear what you guys think about this, is that the lessons that we've learned are actually the, the, the kind of things that we shouldn't be doing. And I don't believe we've quite arrived at where we should be. And I think we're still trying to figure it out. I think we are just speed running financial history on chain is what we're doing. Is we're using distributed ledger technology to speed run <clears throat> the entirety of financial history. Like we started off with just, look, we found gold digital gold and we're going to trade it. And then, you know, we moved on to, you know, being able to do like public fundraising and that was the ICO boom. And then this, this last time it was, yeah, it was a lot of Ponzi. So there was that, but like, we're starting to build out the tooling for, for derivatives. And, you know, there's all sorts of various financial panics that have occurred in the last, you know, two years of crypto universe. And so <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, like we're still working on building things out as they are needed. And it's like, you don't want to just, cause like there have been a lot of protocols that like have tried to build things that exist in TradFi on chain. And like, honestly, until there's a use case for it, those projects usually fail because the, they're, they're, they're too far ahead of where the market currently exists. And we will get there. We will get to that level of sophistication. But the problem is that the people who use those tools, the traditional financial players, the, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, the big institutional money, like those people can't really safely participate in this space yet. And so why would you think that they would need this tooling? Now, if you've got the tooling built and tweaked and stuff by the time that they're ready to come in, you're going to do very well um, because you will have front run the need for said tooling. But like right now, like we're still sort of in like the iron age of, uh, of financialization on chain. And so like, there's still a lot of stuff that needs to happen. And, and honestly, crypto also provides very unique um, <clears throat> a set of problems that you don't have in, in traditional finance so much. And what's interesting is that like so much of that stuff sort of like it, it a lot of it tends to like, it sort of acts like the regulatory frameworks that, exist in traditional finance like there's laws that like you have to have one price across all the various exchanges um and you know mev bots do that every day like they make sure organically or organically without without a regulator 
And then like, I mean, the EVM is the, the best regulator of all because it, it, is, it is heartless in its, in its execution of the law. <clears throat> so there's no political favor that can keep you from being liquidated unless you're yeah. Alameda. <laughs> Boy, it got dirty with the market. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of regulation is designed to uh, to achieve what everyone would hope is achieved organically. And the whole of an organic system behaving as desired reduces to incentive. So it turns out like arbitrage and, and MEV. Um, and uh, it, there's an incentive to engage in these types of activities which have an effect on the system, which ultimately produces a degree of a regulatory outcome, a self-governed system. Uh, where an incentive encourages the regulation to occur without the need of third-party intervention, third-party overlords. And and I find it fascinating that this has played out to a degree over the last couple of years. We, we, we don't know where it's heading, but we see foreshadows of behaviors. We've had experimentation with incentive systems. We've had attempts at duplication of traditional financial structures. And the best case is not duplication of the previously existing systems. It's iteration. And that's what's most interesting because there is no way you could do things in traditional finance the way you could do them on a public blockchain. I go back to a phrase that I used to talk about when I was more involved with the Digibyte community. And it's called public infrastructure, public utility. And I, I haven't talked about this in a bit, but that is an extraordinary revolutionary concept where the general public supports, it would be like the general public supporting the internet. Uh, but no, it's supported by you know, public organizations and and centralized actors and ISPs and corporations and traditional structures. So this is almost inarguably, uh, you can't argue against the fact that this is what public blockchains are. It's a public, it's roads. Uh, and that that's the, that's the, that's the innovation that is right here. And, you know, folks will, you know, right now everyone's going through the hardship and the burden we started talking about, but that that's what's on the surface. And it's, it's not, and then we come back to the, the conversation of like in it for the technology type thoughts. And I don't want to head down that road of, of cope yet, but that's the whole point of why, I talk the way I do for the last years. I've always talked about the damn technology. It was always the technology first, and it was how to understand what the hell is going on, how to peer through the madness. And that is what presents the opportunity. Yeah. You're not in it for the technology. You're speculating because the freaking technology is awesome. And you have to adapt and pivot and do different things depending on conditions. And I think one of the biggest things is that like, this is a space where if you learn to understand it on its terms, you have an advantage over people that have in the traditional world held huge advantages over you. Like if in, in the traditional like 401k, like traditional investing with a, an investment advisor, like there's so many middlemen that are just taking your yield like in between that and collecting rent that like you get table scraps at that point, like when, when you're done investing and like, <clears throat> this is an arena where, you know, we're fighting over, over who gets the bigger stake. Like it's, it's a completely different ball game. And like, I just think that like, why would you play in a market that is very clearly rigged against you? when you can play in one where everyone's fucking confused as to what is going on. Like, 
Like I would much rather be in that market because like I can I can kind of like feel my way through the forest on that. But like when when you have these like huge institutions with like massively sophisticated like just like tooling and um, advantages like you know just on every part of the tech stack you have people that are just stealing uh your ability to you know actually make yield why why play that game when you can play one where everybody is just fumbling through the forest and you know you're relying on your own wits like that's that's where it's at well if we're talking about what is the most interesting market and why I find this space to be what captures my attention and not just shorting the S and P <laughs> it's because, uh, I believe certain things are very obvious and uh, this comes back to geopolitics. It comes back to, uh, central authorities and monetary policy. Um, and we have to deal with draining liquidity conditions, but, what is liquidity? Liquidity is capital. What is capital? Capital is currency. Well, what's the purpose of currency? What's the use case of currency? What are euro dollars? What are stable coins? And stable coins. The biggest damn innovation probably since the first dollar denominated bank deposit in Europe. Oh, they're called euro dollars. So a dollar denominated international bank deposit with a dollar denominated loan. So, you know, I have my thoughts on on the five, ten year time horizon of what the US thinks. You know, like why then here's the speculation. Why would why would they issue their own mm-hmm. CBDC if Circle is negotiating the crap out of something interesting with BlackRock and they're pursuing RRP access. I mean, Treasury and people must be like, oh, what are you trying to do? That's the exact thing we need. That's a, that's a CBDC. Mm-hmm. Oh, what could we do with that? We, we could print a trillion dollars worth of bonds, give them to Circle, and Circle could lend us USDC. Oh, that's a euro dollar. Great. Yup. Yep. I mean, and, and what's interesting is, I don't know if you noticed this, in some of the FTX filings, uh, I think it was like in SBF's like... Uh, criminal filings or whatever that they basically said that the CFTC considers Bitcoin ETH and USDT to be commodities. So that I found very interesting because curiously absent from that statement is USDC, which Mm. if you do the, the mental math there, you go, Oh, Maybe that's because they consider that a CBDC and not a commodity. And, you know, I I think there is a lot of, you know, posturing going on here where, like, I think you're right. I think Circle is positioning themselves to be the de facto CBDC. And having access to, like, the RRP, uh, which is the reverse repo um, at the Fed uh, for those that aren't familiar with uh, such nerdy lingo. Um, But so the RRP means you have to have a master account at the Fed in order to, to participate in that. And so giving circle that, that level of, of bank access will make it so that it is, it is basically a, a de facto CBDC. And, and like, honestly, out of all of the ways that a CBDC could happen, it's not the worst. It's not great, but it's not the worst because like you, you couldn't have a stable coin run against 
CB or a, a CBDC if it's got access to reserves at the Fed. Like it just couldn't happen because the Fed could lend the money in order to fix a liquidity problem. Like there's no more liquidity problems when you have a master account at the Fed because you can always go to the discount window. And so that is a unique thing that, I mean, everybody has always lived in fear of stable coins or their particular stable coin uh, have experiencing a bank run. And like, you, you can't have that when you have a master account at the Fed because the the highest form of currency in the dollar system is dollar deposits at the Federal Reserve. And if you have dollar deposits at the Federal Reserve, you have the Get purest the form of money that you've got. And like everything else is, is basically euro dollars from uh, various degrees of sketchy, uh, you know, banks that keep things off chain, like when it comes to these centralized tables. So like USDT is going to have a hard time competing with an unrunnable stable coin. Yeah. But, uh, but there's a lot of collateral out there. There's a lot of assets that folks want to tap equity. So, yeah. you know, Tether has a complex regulatory and just enterprise situation by functional definition it's a bank they're taking assets as collateral and issuing a liability they have a, yep. a, a debt on their books it's the it's it is literally fits right into the classical definition of a euro dollar situation so circle so, so the treasury could print treasuries uh, loan them to circle borrow stablecoin dollars and then the circle could hit the repo market <laughs> yep. so they get hit it from both ends they get hit the repo market with so treasury could have a printer that has nothing to do with the fed but the fed is just offering uh, the ancillary infrastructure to facilitate this whole thing which is taking her words they're staking yeah. words. <laughs> you stake your reserves at the Federal Reserve and you get a, you know, four point, what is it? Two percent yield. You know, like that is what what the crypto native <laughs> would call uh, four point three. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> that is what the crypto native would call staking rewards. And so you, you stake your reserves at the Fed and then you don't have to buy treasuries and especially short term treasuries because right now uh you know the one month treasury is yielding 3.64 while the rrp is yielding 4.3 <clears throat> so why why would why would the fed not just create its own cbdc why go why partner with circle around this because there's a lot there there's a sort of push and pull here of do you want to end up like authoritarian china where you've got just you know the pathway to you know social credit scores uh or do you want something more like cash and this is sort of on that like continuum in, it sits in the middle, you know, I mean, the, the stable coins on, on the Ethereum blockchain are, they're trackable, they're freezable. They, they have, you know, not all, of them, but yes. Well, yeah, I mean, they're all freezable, but <laughs> they're, they just choose not to freeze them like the ones that are in the curve pool and, and whatnot, because that would cause, you know, uh, you know, there's just a couple that are critically liquid. Um, the yes. pools, the LPs will pose a complexity with regard to velocity, mm. but die is unfreezable, but they're a wow. regulatory target as an organization. I'm referring only to, to USDC at this point. Oh yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm talking only USDC, which is the de facto CBDC. So like, as far as like the continuum of like, 
max authoritarian craziness to, you know, completely anonymous cash. Like we're sitting somewhere in the middle here, like, because obviously you can track USDC and, and honestly, that's like, that's part of the feature of the open blockchain is that you can track things. And I mean, you, you can still create an anonymous wallet. You can still interact with it, with that anonymous wallet. I mean, all things considered, this isn't the worst outcome for a CBDC. So when they said the institutions were coming, they didn't think the Fed would be one of them, did they? People got it wrong. I mean, the Fed, the Fed has been keeping the tabs on this as long as possible. Oh, and here's the other thing. Yeah. The Fed doesn't want to operate the CBDC. They do not want to be in charge of having individual bank accounts for every single person in the country. Like, they do not want that responsibility. Like... And not only that, they wouldn't know what to do with it if they had it. Like, I, it's, but it, it, it would come with all sorts of political spotlight that they do not want. This they would much rather, right. Because, yeah, once you have that power, now it's your responsibility. And now, I mean, all of the Fed's power comes from Congress. So, like, I mean, if, if you piss off Congress, like, you could just end up like completely rugging the entire institution. So like, I, I think they, they recognize that and they, they don't want any part of that bag. So what better way than to have like this, you know, private entity that, you know, will kind of like sit outside of both the, the current, you know, financial system and, also, you know, wield massive amounts of, of public power. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's I mean, not... what, the, what do they want? There's only the extent of what the Treasury and the Fed want is a capacity to maintain the functioning of the system. And the innovation is not necessarily their priority at all. So Treasury has one tool <laughs> they can sell debt it kind of sucks as a tool but that's their only tool so treasury is the government the fed is not the government uh, but treasury has no capacity to issue currency or uh, the, the wait they are the all right fine maybe i don't always know what i'm talking about every step of the way but treasury has a capacity to issue debt and they can monetize their own debt using the configuration the structural configuration that circle is finagling and i find that fascinating it's uh, so but that's aside from printing m0 so m0 it, so that means the m0 wouldn't show it would structurally change the entire system because it wouldn't increase m0 and the monetized debt wouldn't go on the fed balance sheet so it's kind of like backroom monetization it wouldn't well, show in it. <laughs> I mean, much like the Euro dollar system, like the Basel three basically made it so that almost everything, like money market funds were were designed to be backed by treasuries. Like they forced everybody into this. You must back yourselves with US treasuries. And this is all this is, is it's a big money market fund that they're, they're creating. And it's like going to be a, a public money market fund that has access to the RRP. And, um, you know, like it, it's just, it's just another, another big pool of money backed by treasuries that is, as it gets bigger, I think what they're trying to avoid is another situation like we had in 2019. Like they need to give these stable coins access to all the same tools that all the other mo like money market funds have because <clears throat> like, and, and large institutions, because if you don't have access to repo and reverse repo, then when you get these collateral, uh, these situations where you get 
um, a squeeze on collateral because it's in very short supply or when you get massive gluts of money like we had in 2021 where you've got massive amounts of reserves that need a, a place to go like you can <clears throat> end up you know you can put those things in rrp or you can when things get scarce like you can put them in repo and you can you know have all the same stabilization tools that that they've needed to have in this basel 3 system because mm. When you make everyone only own treasuries and you allow them to lever up with treasuries and do whatever they want with treasuries, they're no longer the most safe and liquid thing because like, the, I mean, the Fed is basically required to backstop treasuries at this point. They don't have a choice. Like they don't have a choice because it's either let the financial system collapse because you have forced everybody to back everything with these treasuries or you bail it out. And every time they've chosen bail it out. And so they know that as crypto gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the outstanding balances of these stable coins is going to be greater and greater and greater and more in need of a backstop. So you know, it's <clears throat> think about it as as controls and pressures. So Treasury and the Fed want need a way to both issue an unlimited amount of treasuries without buyers and issue an unlimited amount of currency uh, without consumers. And they and they could park these assets to at one and each other's institutions and issue these assets and one in each other's institutions to finagle the liquidity conditions of the system to make sure that every everything is balanced and in harmony, harmony a, a, a homogenous state, if you will, properly managed milk product. <laughs> so the Fed, uh, the, the, the Treasury could issue treasuries loan them to circle circle could issue stable coin and what have we built out over the last few years a capacity to consume stable coins in retail operations uh, you can literally just walk into a convenience store and spend a stable coin as if it was a currency unit um now and that's what that's the other that's the other thing that's coming once once they do this is you will be able to have an official currency that they want adoption for because to this point, the government has stifled off ramps hugely and on ramps for that matter. And then they they point to crypto and see they go, see, look, nothing useful happens over there. Well, that's because you won't let anything useful happen over there. Like you have stifled the ability to get things on and off chain to mm -hmm. the point where like you can't do it. But you, you can't point to that as an example for why crypto isn't valuable because the second that you make a legitimate path for people to do this stuff on chain rather than off chain, there is going to be a huge push of things into the crypto ecosystem. And they're trying to stave that off as, as long as possible to be able to set up this bureaucracy so that they can use it to their advantage. That usually is the case. You know, my, that it always comes back to where my interest in the market is, uh, is exchange and tether and geopolitics. So there's never one currency for the world. And my, my daughter is offering me a present. I'm going to show the world. <laughs> Sweetheart, I'm on a phone call, but let me show the world your delicious present. <laughs> this will take two seconds. <gasps> It's an ice cream cone. So Captain Rash oh, is a my. human being. Wow. Uh, that's that's, oh that's, my awesome. God. that's amazing. I love you, <laughs> sweetheart. Um, <laughs> that's adorable. I'll be done in a little bit. You take your ice cream cone and protect it for daddy. Protect it at all costs. <laughs> no matter the liquidation threshold, okay? Um. So, So what I find is that uh, domestically, obviously, folks will want to use uh, USDC for a variety of reasons, and the government might even come to the point where they use it, and the government might come to the point where they encourage the use of it. Um, 
clearly that's their solution for uh, capital distribution in the case of a uh, of a retail and and public consumption liquidity crisis, which basically translates to people are broke and they can't buy food and and, they, and there's a requirement to maintain social order. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point of government. Uh, now they have a capacity to instantaneously distribute capital, uh, uh, spendable capital directly to people. Um, and and that's, that's the power of the public utility. You're bypassing the banking infrastructure. So the public utility, that's ultimately the, the biggest perspective on the innovation. Uh, you, you have traditional banking rails, which is a building you have to go to to get a piece of paper. Um, but now that's all done. Uh, 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 clearly, it still exists, but now they have an alternative. They have a way to not do the shit show that it took them all of 2020 to send out paper checks to people. It's at least an alternative. And this, there'll be hurdles. There's always a hurdle with the technology. But the point is, they tried and they did what they did in 2020 because um, that was the extent of what was possible. Now they have something else that they can consider to consume to do the things that they'll ultimately need to do at some point in the future. Yep. And I think the the interesting the the other part of the story which interests me probably even more than kind of like the raw US dollar aspect of it is the the myriad of other currencies. You sp you speak about exchange and you speak about the importance of exchange and how that manifests on all levels. Then we need to consider other countries and their needs and how that all mixes into this huge pot where the three witches kind of lord over. And I think that's where it's going to get really interesting, you know, from the Euro perspective, Asia, you know, and, and that's kind of like almost the, the avalanche around this whole thing where we will reach a point where stable coins, namely digital currencies, will be the biggest market cap entities on the planet. And it will all land up operating on this, well, not all of it, but a lot of it will be operating on this blockchain ledger open system. And even with the bureaucracy, it's going to be really interesting to see how, you know, these guys try and kind of prevent the fuckery and the shit show from being revealed to the rest of the world. But I have a question. What role does Bitcoin have to play in this whole thing? Or is Bitcoin just going to be like something that sits on the wayside and never fulfills its potential for what it was meant to be? Because ultimately never... we are talking about we are talking about Bitcoin now, but Bitcoin is not able to fulfill this role in its current in its current in its current state. Nope. It sure isn't. <laughs> I, I think that the, the censorship resistance of Bitcoin is absolutely a great feature. It is definitely the most censorship resistant form of, you know, stored value that exists that I can think of anyway, aside from like actual physical gold, like um, that's probably slightly better because you can't track it the way you can. Um, but I, I just, I have a, a lot of difficulty with the store of value decisions that were made with the design of Bitcoin in that everyone wants to hodl it. Nobody wants to spend it. So it's not money. If you yeah, don't right. want to spend it, it's not money. <laughs> like, and like, I, I, you can see this just in the way that like Bitcoin maximalism has like kind of like grown up basically out of the fact that like they've stopped innovating on Bitcoin. Like initially, like there was a lot of innovation that happened like in the first few years of, of Bitcoin to try to like, um, you know, make this stuff easier to use and stuff like that. But like, I think deep down, everybody recognizes that it's just a really slow to play out, like kind of a Ponzi, like just really, really slowly playing out 
that everybody knows that you need to get more people in in order for this thing to work. And so, but they, they don't want to change it and they don't want to make it like, I mean, you got the lightning network, but the problem is the incentives are still broken. Like even if you make a, a layer two for Bitcoin, nobody still wants to spend it because hodling is the game theoretic ideal in this situation. And until you fix that by getting rid of the 21 million hard cap and actually make it so that people are incentivized to actually use it as money, I just don't see the path forward for it. Like, I mean, I think it will, in the short term, it'll be fine. Like there's nothing like inherently broken with it, like in the, in the short to midterm, it's just long-term. I just don't see the plan. Never mind the whole security budget thing, which I've gone into before, but like, I mean, we're at the same price for Bitcoin. We were like five years ago. So we've had a halving since then. So the security budget just got cut in half, you know, and if we wait a couple more years, it'll get cut in half again. If we don't get the price up. So. This is the yeah. same burden with, with uh, everything with, with, with curve. The price has to go up in order to encourage the entire uh, cyclical nature of uh, of the market. Um, everything, you know, the, I, I don't use the word Ponzi. They're, they're, over the years, we'll be able to better describe these systems because that was a person, that was his strategy, and it was ruled that it was not reasonable from a financial perspective to do what he did. But everything is dependent on pressures. Uh, and, yeah, supportive and depressive pressures. So I say it's all the same because the entire system is supported by the pressure of productivity and organized labor. And the whole point of a financial market and a currency system is to organize that labor and facilitate incentive systems to perpetuate the, the continuation of that uh, productive activity. So it's all a Ponzi based on that. Yeah, uh, that, uh, agreed. That, that is that, that, that is fair. Using the word Ponzi. But hang on, hang on. Wait, this, I, I'd really like to. I need your thoughts, please, sir, for <laughs> the sake of my sanity, on Bitcoin specifically and not as a general thing. Because I value your general your general perspective. I do value and I appreciate it. But I'd really like to hear what your thoughts are on Bitcoin specifically, and and specifically, what the fuck next. So Bitcoin failed with regard to the uh, intent or the intent of the white paper can be achieved, but the implementation cannot achieve it. So it failed to a degree and it is more likely than less likely to succeed to a degree. We could debate its monetary policy, which is disinflation. It's not a deflationary currency. Uh, I would say it's a currency because it has units that are transactable that have value so we could argue what the definition of currency is all day if we want um peer-to-peer -peer payments nobody's going to use it as a payment system for exactly what ben said uh the the uh, there's a reason why uh, Keynesian economists do what they do with monetary policy a, uh, an effective currency so there's a distinction between a currency and an effective currency is that the relative value of it should neither decrease nor increase uh, you want it to be spendable and uh, relative value that's another conversation because that's relative to what relative to i would say commodities and consumer staples so in that regard you need adaptable adaptable characteristics of monetary policy and, and incentives to adjust to the conditions of, uh, of supply availability for commodities and consumer staples. So we are, we're a long way as a species from optimally uh, creating optimal systems uh, to respond to the dynamic nature of every component of the financial system. Fed does decent in that regard, but whatever. <laughs> so Bitcoin... You know, we could we could criticize proof of work. Uh, we could be critical of the supply cap, which is a complexity in 140 years. So we'll be long dead before anyone here has to really consider the ultimate ramifications of that. So until then, what's most pertinent is today. 
In that regard, the monetary policy is disinflationary, so that means it's inflationary. Every single day, there is more and more Bitcoin in circulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is just a truly grandiose misconception by a lot of the narrative talked about in the Bitcoin community. And that's unfortunate. It's not deflationary. Mm -hmm. It is an inflationary on a short duration time frame, which is a four-year cycle. And at best on a four-year cycle, it's disinflationary, which means it's inflationary. So for the love of God, people. <laughs> okay, so as a currency, as a spendable currency, it's clearly a transactable currency, but as a reasonable, reasonable currency to spend, um, nobody in their right mind is going to spend Bitcoin. Uh, but L2, Lightning, that's awesome. I, I like what they're doing and building. And the project that I think is the most meaningful is called Stable Sets. Uh, you, uh, you know, Delta Neutral, you sell longs and shorts, and basically you're, you're creating a synthetic dollar uh, using Bitcoin as collateral. Uh, and that synthetic dollar is a manifestation of the, the guaranteed behavior of humans to speculate long and short. And they are facilitating the creation of a, a, a synthetic currency unit collateralized by Bitcoin, as well as this uh, allowed by the speculation. So that's lovely. Uh, now, now that's great tech. Bitcoin, and I'm not, I'm, Bitcoin is lovely. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> but great tech, the best tech is not necessarily the best investment. Yeah. And we've seen that time and time again throughout history. Um, you know, better tech does not always disrupt the status quo. Uh, what, what, what was it like uh, Laserdisc or Betamax? Come on. HD DVDs. Betamax versus VHS, yeah. <clears throat> so DVDs. better tech is yeah. not necessarily a great investment. I would yeah. love, so right now, about 75% of my capital expenditure on a monthly basis, it's been like this for the last six months since uh, Bitcoin Miami. There's a lot of details in that, but I will not get into that. Uh, has been uh, stablecoin expenditures. And and there's a whole complexity there of personal financial management. But suffice it to say, uh, and I, I could do that because of Juno and, and BitPay and and off ramps, spritz finance, which I haven't used, but I have a capacity to off ramp with Gemini and Kraken. So I'm able to manage and spend uh, capital earned in crypto markets. So that's the burden for Bitcoin. And uh, what Jack is working on it, Jack Mahler, mm -hmm. but it hasn't manifested yet. Nothing matters unless you could spend something to buy an egg sandwich. <laughs> Yes. Yep. For all you Twitter followers out there, uh, if you cannot, that so the first and foremost thing for anyone that wants to engage with the crypto markets to learn is how to spend it, and then you figure out how to make it. And and the other problem that I that I have with like Bitcoin, not only is it like not a good medium of exchange because it's, I mean, there are various like ways, like you know, at the, I've seen like the ability to like buy things at McDonald's using Bitcoin or whatever, using the Lightning Network. Um, it's not a great unit of account. Like you need, like sats are way too small and Bitcoins are way too big <laughs> like to be a unit of account for you to be able to like spend things in your day-to-day -day life. You know, like I, I, how would like, how do you intuitively know how many sats you would need to buy an egg salad sandwich? I, I, I don't, uh, yeah, it, it's difficult. It's but difficult. that's also but that's also the other thing that that's quite interesting about the discussion we're having is that Bitcoin has also been been reinvented along the way. So it was a currency and it was a medium like peer to peer payment, and then it became digital gold. And you know, even though even though there's there is an argument right now that states that it that has been kind of like a hedge against inflation just because inflation has been just so ridiculous it hasn't really it's it's kind of like like you said you hit the nail on the head ben and you said the price of bitcoin today is the same as it was five years ago and is it just about price well you know the maxis will pretend that it isn't but it actually is 
because they're all talking about when it's going to be a million dollars. And, you know, the, the only reason why they wanted the institutions to come in is so that they'd buy their bags, but they'll never admit that. And it's kind of like this, the self-fulfilling prophecy of why it's so easy to call it a Ponzi along the lines of, and you're right, you, you're hundred percent right. No, if you look at everything in the context of how, you know, in terms of pressure systems and the rest of it, it's all a fucking Ponzi anyways. And you could yes. argue it quite easily. The stock but, market Ponzi. Yeah, like everything. everything's a Ponzi. If you need people <laughs> to come after you to buy it to make it worth that money, then it's a Ponzi. Then it's a Ponzi. Yeah. Yeah. Like and, and, and that's, unfortunately that's what's happened with Bitcoin as well. Yeah. And and that's that I think Noah, that was good of you to call out the fact that like the the word Ponzi gets thrown around, I think, far too much. Uh yeah. because you're right. It's all about pressures. And like, you know, I, a, a Ponzi, like, it, it's hard to really draw that distinct line. <laughs> well, there's a very, a very d distinct line. And that's exactly what Pon, Charles Ponzi did. And that's exactly I mean, what SBF did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's spending other people's money. Yes. And yes. requiring new money to pay the old people like that's a different thing than just needing new people to come in to buy a thing because like one of those things is a natural market and the other one is a facade yes so but aren't they the, but aren't they the same thing though it's just that the facade is no. a third party that's there as opposed to a mechanism one one uh, looks like a natural market one of them is a natural market. I think. Yeah. I think that's the, really the distinction there. Like one arm's length. It's arm's yeah. length. It's the same thing that the government always talks about. It's about the. Uh, that's what they're talking about with SPF. There was no arm's length between Alameda and FTX, so you had yes. conflict of interest. So the arm's length for Bitcoin is their <laughs> mining is a very separate party as, as compared to uh, people buying Bitcoin. So you definitely have arm's length there. So it's. By, by even classical definition, it doesn't fit the Ponzi scheme. Not a Ponzi. Bitcoin, not a Ponzi. But it's but, all a Ponzi because cool. if no one's buying and we don't have the pressure, the whole system falls apart mm -hmm. and you have uh, Thunderdome. <laughs> Thunder <laughs> when was, when was the last when did when was the last time you watched that movie? There's a question for you. <laughs> Probably in the nineties, but uh, you know Yeah, man. <laughs> Tina Turner. Yeah, that was actually quite a cool movie. I love the Mad Max movies. They were great fun um, before Mel Gibson lost the plot. So I think that like part of the problem too is that like when you talk about Bitcoin innovation, like it's always just everybody brings up Jack. Like it's, it's I mean, like there should be more people. You shouldn't be able to just like name the, the key innovators in the Bitcoin space like on one hand like i think that's yeah. really the the other big problem is that like ethereum has sort of captured the the val like the the mind share from the innovators and because like it's easy to make money in the the ethereum space uh as an innovator and like bitcoin sort of requires this sort of idealism of its innovators and, and it almost requires like th they don't want you to have a token they don't want you to be able to like you know you, you need to do it selflessly for the the good of humanity if you want to innovate on bitcoin and it, it it's like I, I mean that's that's sort of like what the the, the maxis would espouse and it's like I don't know. It, it just feels like there's a sort of like purity and puritism that, that takes place there where Ethereum is like, make whatever you want, do whatever you want with it. Here's some rails, have fun, go nuts. And like, it, it, it makes a far more dynamic system. I mean, it's full of much more nefariousness and rugs and, you know, scams and, but you know, build anything. Yeah. I mean, it's the wild west out, out there and you know, it's I underperformed the shit out of the market because I did not want to engage with that activity. And it's been two years running that I've 
come to the narratives that I have currently to peer through the bullshit. And, and, it, and in hindsight, I executed according to the way I currently understand the markets. And in retrospect, I underperformed the shit out of the markets. But I would have done it the same exact way because what I always saw in the market was the not bullshit. The stuff yeah. that was actually real and interesting and meaningful to society and powerful iterative infrastructure that traditional finance will significantly benefit from. And, uh, and I, I mean, I just want to own the Forex market. I tried to call HSBC one time and be like, I want to I want to own a piece of your Forex market. And they didn't understand what I was talking about. And uh, I, mean, isn't <laughs> that... I just want to do thing... that. I think that is interesting is Forex on chain. I feel like you can't really do it until a currency has deposits at their reserve bank or at their central bank, because otherwise you're comparing Euro dollars to other Euro current, like other, like, you know, offshore currencies. And it's not really the same thing as trading a currency if you're trading. I mean, you're, you've sort of created a euro dollar market, but like a very shallow and illiquid one. Sure. Um, still like, a forex market. I, I, you're right. It is still a forex market. But like, I mean, just the dominance of the dollar on, on crypto too is just insane. Like it is just so dominant. Like euro stables are just pitifully well, liquid and i'm a i'm a brent that johnson will, that guy will but that will change it will definitely change i i just yes but i also firmly believe in the things he talks about you know my favorites are like oh, yeah. brent and and luke groman and and everything other than the dollar is an emerging market currency and that and that is what it is and it's not like it's, that's not demean, meant to be demeaning. It's just, it is what it is. In times of a liquidity crisis, nobody wants any currency other than a dollar. Those markets are emerging as compared to the dollar. Well, <laughs> everybody's debts are in dollars. That's that's what that's why why everybody wants the dollars is is invoicing is done in dollars for for international uh, trade, and people want dollars because. That's what they're going to need to pay their debts the next few years. Well, the you know, while the shit's hitting the fan, they need dollars, and so like that's why you get these runs on the euro dollar system and stuff because everybody's scrambling for dollars. It's you know two things. They opted into it. So, and this is what I talk about with regard to my observations of a couple of protocols of the crypto space. You can't. You can force it, and the U.S. forced their system by pricing <laughs> commodities. Indeed, and, and that, that's this part of the story. Oh, of, uh, is that a book? So this this is a quarterly report from one of the traditional finance investments that I have. You know, kind of keeping it real, and this came in the mail today. That's funny. Um, <laughs> exactly what we're talking about. The system dies with relative dollar strength in Forex markets, where every other currency is crushed relatively uh, because of the debt burden. At some point, they can't pay their debts, and then they have to print to buy dollars, which runs up the dollar to pay their debts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, and, that, and this is mutually exclusive, independent to the value of the dollar domestically, U.S., for commodities. So the very complex things to wrap your head around, you know, CP, consumer price inflation versus currency inflation are completely different topics of conversation, yet they both contain the word inflation. So they're confusing. Yep. So, the, so the U.S. forced so two things that created the United States. One was uh, pricing commodities in dollars. And two was the voluntary organic adoption of the global debt system using dollars. So it's both. So in in in, uh, in crypto markets, the, the so we've identified a couple of fascinating occurrences, and one of them I believe is the 
organic accumulation, the, the, the voluntary choice for many protocols, a dozen, it's, I'm pretty sure it's over a dozen, software that is mandated in the, in the algorithms to accumulate the assets of other protocols. And is that not a reserve? That's exactly what a sovereign reserve is doing. They're accumulating the assets of other currencies for purposes of sustainability, for purposes of resiliency during times of stress, for purposes of control and governance over external activities. And that's the phenomenon we're experiencing in organic adoption. Yep. I mean, the crypto market, it is it is dollar driven. Like so all the stable coins, like all the, the CDP stables are debts denominated in dollars. And like, I think what if, if, if this circle CBDC thing that we've speculated on here, if, if this comes to pass, I think what you are ultimately going to see is I think Tether will sort of like just kind of wither away over time. Um, because I think what will happen is Circle, once they have access to the RRP, it prevents this sort of like stable coin drain that you get during the bear market, right? Because yeah, yeah. what happens is right now, interest rates are, call them 4%, right? And so now holding a stable coin, you're losing 4% worth of opportunity cost by keeping it on chain versus pulling it off and investing in treasuries. That is a 4% hit that you are taking. And I think once Circle gets named the de facto CBDC, they will be able to offer staking that will give you an interest rate at risk whatever risk-free risk interest rate, basically, essentially giving everyone the ability to, I mean, I'm sure that they will require KYC in order to do this, but it will prevent some of that, that drain where, where, where stuff leaves the crypto ecosystem. Instead, it will just go to the staking contract that circle has set up. But I, I mean, I think that's what will happen. And over time, you know, every time you get these drawdowns, what'll happen is, People will swap their tether for USDC in order to capture that arbitrage on rates as they wait for the financial conditions to improve. And all those flows will be on chain. But like eventually, I think what will probably happen is like at some point, we'll, we'll find out when the tide goes out whether tether's been, you know, swimming naked or not. But like by the time they do, they might be small enough that it's not really that big of a deal. Because like, I mean, they've been able to handle it so far, uh, you know, when things go out. But it's hard to know what they're holding, what they got. Eh. Here's a, a couple of observations. One, it would be an enormous pressure on other stable coins if Circle had... So bear in mind, the RRP is for dollars lent to the Fed, which means Circle could accept dollar deposits and offer a rate of return on USDC. Um, and the, the repo market is for securities, which would give the treasury the capacity to print currency units. Um, so that would be an enormous burden on every other stable coin other than uh, Circle, at direct access to the currency issuer. Uh, so sir, uh, Tether, I just wanted to highlight, um, Collateralization, you know, it's an interesting thing. It's all about trust. So if Circle had access to the RRP and, uh, and, uh, and the, the repo market, that would instill trust. So unfortunately, Tether would be additionally burdened because of this, the whole arguments that have been um, uh, talked about against them for, for years at this point. But conceptually, you know, there's very little risk to Tether holders uh, for their capacity to redeem. Why? Because the tether is the liability. If someone gives um, tether $200 million in T-bills and borrows $200 million in tether, they don't 
owe Tether $200 million. They owe them 200 million tethers. The price is irrelevant. It's 200 million tethers. Though that's the liability unit that needs to be redeemed to regain access to the collateral. So I think just a lot is not understood about likely what they do, or at least conceptually how it would make sense, how it makes sense to me what they do. Tether could collapse the price on chain, 90 cents, 80 cents, 50 cents. You still just need to give 200 million tethers back to get access to your original $200 million dollar valued collateral. Oh, well, um, until, until the collateral runs out. That's that's really what people are worried about. Once Once there's no more collateral to be had and there's still tethers on chain to be had, that is where you would run into the issue where those liabilities are no longer backed. So why would the, so this comes back to like, you know, accounts and account integrity and account management. If I give Tether $200 million worth of T-bills, I don't expect them to exchange those damn T-bills for something else. I don't expect them to manage it in a master account. I have a damn account. That's my collateral. And they don't touch it. So this comes back to like, uh, U.S. Uh, account management rules and literally what SPF f- fucked up royally. Uh, there's no community pool. It's an account. Uh, and if they do, if they behave like that, then everything makes sense to me. Uh, and now I give the benefit of the doubt most of the time. Now, obviously, if they're if they fail, they're I they're not engaging. Yeah. One of the things that. <sighs> I always sort of suspect, like, let, let's pretend, I, like, I'm not a big, like, tether truther guy, but let's just think about this. If you were tether, put yourselves in the shoes of tether. As long as there is a curve three pool that has liquidity that you can dump in for USDC, all you need is some sort of relationship with somebody who can deposit, you, you deposit tethers, completely unbacked maybe. Let's pretend they're completely unbacked. You deposit them in there, you pull out some USDC, exchange it for actual collateral. Now you have stopped the bank run. Bank run. But you did it using actual money while you were holding nothing. So as long as there is liquidity in the three pool, you literally cannot go under. So just a thought, just something to consider that all these bank runs that they've survived until you get to the point where you have drained the three pool, they could be operating unbacked and you would have no idea. I'm, I'm back. I, 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 I would love a protocol. <laughs> I would love a protocol exactly as, as I described it, which would, which would be what Tether does, but according to the rigorous operating procedures that I've described, where every single person has an individual account and I have a liability and that debt is on the books because they issued the liability against the collateral deposit. And if everything is segregated, accounts are separated like that, and each account has those assets in custody, then that is a completely functional system. And that is independent from the business practice, the, the, uh, the, the operational requirement to maintain a peg. Now, bear in mind, LUSD does pretty well, and that's not an actively maintained peg. Uh, but look, Frax does pretty good. So Frax is a, another topic because uh, of their AMOs. So how Tether maintains peg and why peg tightness is such a critical consideration, because that really comes down to just uh, in tech, um, trust. And uh, when you lose peg, people start to have... Uh, feelings, but that's a, a very difficult thing to maintain. You need a lot of additional capital to maintain PEG. Uh, but when you're uh, think about it very simply, if you are expensive, if Tether is a bucko bucko one, you need to print Tether and sell it. 
And if Tether is 99 cents, you need to have another currency, a reserve currency, USDC, to buy Tether to increase the price. So, in so, the curve pool. <laughs> in the curve pool. But it's where where is it? it that you know, it all all roads lead back to stable coins, to currency units, the, the conversation about the significance of a peg. Uh, to lindiness and trust and and very fascinating philosophical concepts and technologies that are implementing these philosophical concepts. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole on-chain, off-chain interface is where things get messy. Like all the on-chain stuff, pretty easy to wrap your head around. There's, you know, contracts you can deposit in. There's oracles that keep track of prices. Fairly, fairly straightforward, you know, but like deterministic, it, it is, it's very deterministic. And like when things get wrecked and you, you hear about hacks that happen, a lot of times it's just, you know, one of like two things probably wipes out like the majority of hacks. One is like crappy price oracles and then, you know, callable functions that shouldn't have been callable. Like, you know, if, if you get rid of those two things, how many hacks did you just eliminate? Like, because like people lend against illiquid collateral and then lo and behold, somebody starts manipulating that and manages to borrow against illiquid collateral and wrecks the protocol. Like that is mango markets and, you know, probably two or three different cream attacks and like, you know, there's just been like, like so many hacks that are just Oracle based, like you lent against an illiquid thing. You are looking at the price with a price Oracle, but thanks to that, the price. You can, it's easy to manipulate the price when there's no liquidity. Yeah. It's not hard. So. These are fascinating concepts. Uh, and how do you, uh, so I, I, what's, What's most wonderful about the crypto markets is how fast things iterate. Anytime there's a breach or an instability, I mean, you know, Mango was just drained, but that same attack vector was executed against Curve on Ave, and that resulted in a couple million bad debt. But that's and, just fascinating. And the GMX uh, AVAX thing. I mean, that was another example of the same thing. Like li liquidity just got a little tight on, on AVAX and, and they started uh, manipulating the price. the price around and leveraging GLP holders, uh, you know, money. But look, that, that it produces the resiliency. What yeah. happens when you survive? Lindiness. Exactly, exactly. And it, it, it teaches you the hard way not to lend against illiquid garbage. <laughs> Right, you know, especially and and this is one of the things that I keep harping on is and it's just like, you know, you if you own a, a lending and borrowing or if you're you know on the team of a lending and borrowing protocol, you cannot. I mean, the fact that these loans are in perpetuity, you have to not you can't think about like oh is liquidity good today, like. Is liquidity good three years from now, five years from now? Like, you don't know when they're going to pay back this loan. It's perpetual. Like, how, like, what is the liquidity going to be like in five years? If you don't have an answer to that, like, you have to have ways of, like, either extracting the full value of the loan out of these people in the form of their collateral as the liquidity deteriorates, or you need, like, to find a way to cap the duration. Like those are your only two options because you can't just watch the liquidity deteriorate, 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 and then, you know, have to sell into that when they finally get liquidated. Because again, like if the liquidity is thin enough, you could keep the price above your liquidation with a small amount of money on a very large loan. And then by the time the you know price actually drops there's no liquidity left to 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 liquidate into and it's like so ben you you're somebody who's actually working on a team of this nature 
I am. I am on the and, uh, tab- uh, you're on the tapioca da team. So, how are you guys going to be solving this exact issue? Being very, very picky about our our uh, what collateral is used on to back this the the stable is is the answer. Like, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. If you back a stable coin, because a stable coin is essentially a pooled asset, right? I mean, you can you can you can have like isolated lending markets, but if they're all backing a single stable coin, you have a common mode failure there. And so you need to be very careful about what backs your stable coin. You can have like lend and borrow markets where it's like you lend into this contract, you borrow from this contract and you have different people that lend their money and borrow their money. And then you collect the spread. Like that's, that's normal, like lending and borrowing on chain. But like, if you're going to create an on-chain stable, you need to protect that thing with your, you know, proverbial life. Cause like you need to make sure that your, your liquidations are on point. You need to make sure that you're, uh, ability to uh, manage the the system liquidity are airtight because otherwise you end up with bad debt and then uh, you know as we've seen like the you you end up with this like Sophie's choice sort of situation where when this happens you either let your your stable coin die or you deplete your treasury in its entirety those are your two choices because your 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 if your stable to- coin goes to crap so with it goes your protocols uh and they just you know, gone your your protocol is is now like dead to the world and if you you know so it's it's an easy choice you deplete the treasury and you hope that in the future it doesn't happen again and you know you know yeah but there goes the treasury but there the goes problem the is you need and you then need you, both. You, yes, you need both, and it, so you've got to, you've got to protect. You got to keep making making money on on the one to fill the treasury, and then you've got to protect that treasury by not doing dumb shit with your <laughs> stable coin, and and you know it is a dark forest. So you've got to be, you've got to be very very diligent in that that regard. So I had a paper I wrote a while back, a Medium article. It's a little dated at this point, but if I looked at it, I'd probably say it's pretty much still relevant. I called it the innovative stablecoin. And I was conceptualizing what contributes most significantly to the attribute of survivability. And everyone talks about these reserves. And the only significance of reserves is two things. One, <laughs> Uh, uh, something to use to capitalize as uh, the working capital, which is what Frax does. The stables are deployed as stables and produce significant revenue from LPs. And there's a high degree of integrity because it's literally, it's not like an exchange of assets. It's not uh, an investment. They're deploying them as stables for purposes of liquidity. And two is the price point, which is the peg, which is, which is completely, which means what I focused on was dominance, something that uh, even Frax doesn't do to the extremity that I was envisioning. It's peg dominance. So Frax dominates peg using its AMOs, but not to the extreme because Curve has a heck of a threshold with regard to what constitutes a decent peg and there's variance. So I, I was trying to conceive of a protocol that would entirely dominate the peg. Like tick for tick, the pool balance would be identical. One million tether, one million novel stable coin. Always, no matter what. So clearly you could always reduce the price of a stable coin instantaneously because you have your the min function in the contract. And to dominate from the downside, you need to accumulate reserves. So, you know, I'm not going to digress too much into the paper. I could dig it up if folks are interested. Uh, but the whole art there would be 
incentive systems to accumulate reserve assets and explicit declaration. This has nothing to do with backing of the stablecoin. This has everything to do with dominance of peg and having adequate working capital to achieve that. You can always dominate from the top side and reduce the price of the stable, and you need an adequate amount of capital to be able to purchase to raise the price of the asset. So then the only remaining critical requirement is to never get your head in front of the skis. The size of liquidity and circulation can never exceed your capacity to completely balance the stablecoin by how much reserves you have. So you can only increase liquidity and circulation if you're if you're able to create uh, if you're if the general public purchases something you're offering and you're able to raise capital. Yep. So now you have additional working it's capital true. to purchase. Yeah, you're you're completely backing it with a treasury essentially. So, it's there's probably a lot to digest uh, about what what it is metaphoric of, but you know I just I wanted to get away from the thinking of a stablecoin as a hundred percent backed. It's I I would I would say no. Stop looking at backing and look at the protocol's capacity to maintain this one hundred percent balanced pool. Focus on that and that alone. And if we could prove that we have a capacity, if one hundred percent of the of the stable coins in circulation are sold we can make sure that pool is 100 percent balanced no matter what and that is the you, innovative yeah yeah i mean and and the way you the way you do that is by building up a treasury that you can backstop any any fluctuation in price you can you want to fire sale it let's do it i'll buy it you know so to some degree frax talks about that like they have that dominance they can backstop the complete liquidation of all frax and circulation uh, and the the fun thought experiment i was going through is like how do i take that to extreme how do you spin a narrative to get people away from the concept of reserves and is tether completely back no one gives a shit they care about if the peg is one dollar if i could sell this thing for one dollar under any circumstance and that peg is there that's the power of a stable coin. And the thing that I think that people just misunderstand about Tether is that like the, the game theoretic optimal solution for them is not to share what's backing Tether. Huh. <laughs> because if you share what's backing it, somebody can like, especially when you're dealing with the, their kind of size, like state actors could just mess with whoever they're they're buying things for like once you find out what they own it's a lot easier to mess with the the people that are you know selling it to them and like you can there's all sorts of things you could do to manipulate those particular markets to to fund whatever is backing them if you have no idea what's backing it good luck good luck trying to get a narrative around i don't know they might be insolvent you know, like it, it's a lot harder to have a bank run when nobody ever knows what's backing them. Like, it, like it's hard to have a, a, a cohesive, coordinated FUD attack when nobody knows what, what the backing is. So it's, it, it's sort of a safety mechanism on their part to just keep all that completely secret. So it's entirely possible that they are completely backed. Maybe they are. We don't know. You don't know. And that's a feature, not a bug. I mean, to them. I agree. To, to us, it's it's a bug. But like, you know, from their perspective, that's a feature because they have private holdings that, you know, go ahead, sell your tether, see if I can redeem it. And then so far, they've always been able to redeem it. And so it's like, so they have a narrative spin <laughs> issue and it, and it plays into the, the stablecoin concept i was talking about like redemption i don't think they have any problem whatsoever with redemptions uh, if they follow the rules that i was talking about like it, isolated accounts because all you have is the liability denominated in tether to gain regain access to your posted collateral for the debt um it, the price is irrelevant the, the a tether can be worth zero usdc and 
you still have a million tether to redeem your collateral. So that the, the, the complexity with tether is having enough working capital to manage the operation of peg maintenance. Mm-hmm. Yep. And whether they're out in front of their skis or not, because uh, they their peg has slipped to right. a significantly greater degree as compared to the Frax uh, stablecoin implementation. And so, when you calculate and... the length of their skis, you got to look at the curve pool. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The curve pool. <laughs> so what happened? So what happened in light of this conversation with Luna? How does it all relate to Luna and what happened to FTT? You never, you never use your own asset as collateral. Yes, that's that is true. It's, this is a burden. Like Luna, the problem was it wasn't actually backed by anything. Their their thing was again peg maintenance. It was peg maintenance, is what they were counting on. But the problem, the real real problem that that completely screwed them was they got out in front of their skis by offering a 20% interest rate that they couldn't afford. Mm. And eventually the inflows stopped Stop. or at least slowed down to the point where they couldn't maintain the peg on a UST balance that size with, while also maintaining that high uh interest rate i mean it's it's classic like you know currency like emerging market currency issue except they just speed ran it by offering 20 percent when the the broader market was offering you know one you know like that was always going to end badly you need to charge like if, if they had offered one percent a it wouldn't have gotten so big if they would offer 2%, 3%, 4%, it wouldn't have gotten so big. Like they could have offered, you know, a different percentage and they would have still had enough to actually be able to manage the peg. But the problem was that they were just pushing and inflating this thing and inflating this thing, allowing like using ab abracadabra to lever it up and just and like getting this thing to the point where they couldn't even manage the, the gyrations of the market with Luna. And then eventually it started expressing itself via the peg. And then the way their mechanism works, it mints Luna to backstop UST. And then you just get an infinite mint. Boom, dead. Like it's not hard, you know? Like they violated the first rule of a balance sheet you don't spend more money than you make. And that's the nature of pool twos, hyperinflation. Yeah. You, and they were, uh, hiding, that's, they were hiding how yeah. much they were making. Horrible. Uh, it makes uh, liquidity look very interesting with their chicken bonds. Uh, it's a gamified bond with the NFT. But where does the yield come from? It's their revenue from their giant protocol-owned liquidity, which earns curve as well as transaction fees. And that's printed right on their page. And if more liquidity goes in, that revenue gets diluted, but that liquidity gets put into the LP, which generates more revenue. So it's a very interesting dynamic. And as long as the CapEx never exceeds the income, there's a balanced balance sheet. So it's literally just standard business practice that goes into <laughs> which is a... surprisingly rare in crypto. Like, yeah, just make sure your gazinta is more than your gazauta, and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so we got finagling, we got gazunta and gaz what? <laughs> gazunta <laughs> and gazauta. There we go. There you go. I mean, Those yeah, are the three just... words I'm taking home with me tonight. Thank you. So there's a sustainability model. And really, what, this goes back to where we started the conversation about the way I look at markets and why I appreciate the buffer mentality so much. It's literally traditional value investing. Inspect the damn balance sheet. Expect CapEx to be less than, uh, than income. Expect, uh, look for incentive systems to drive capital inflow. And, and from a crypto perspective, look for determinism, immutability, 
And these are characteristics of survivability. And survivability contributes to lindiness. And what happens in the next market, in the future market, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the shit that survives all this maelstrom of liquidity flow, uh, which is basically just a capital market, uh, uh, an emerging market capital, uh, capital flow cycle, those are the trusted protocols. They've built the lindiness and uh, they have the survivability attribute. Anyway, that was a quick couple of sentences of what the hell's going on. Yeah. The, the bear market is for surviving, you know. And before, they, before we, before, before we go, before we go, because we have, we, 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 we could probably carry on for another three hours, the three of us. Three days. <laughs> uh, you're underselling I mean, us. No, this conversation, this conversation has been absolutely amazing. But we've got to draw the line. And the line that I'm going to draw here is I'm going to ask you both a question. And that is, Ben, you can go first. What does financial freedom look like for you? And what does it mean for you? So there's two questions there. I think it's the ability to do what you want with your time. That, that's really what it boils down to. Financial freedom is the ability for you to do what you want with your time and to spend your time doing things you want to do. Like, I don't think I'm there yet, <laughs> but like that is, that is where, that is where I think uh, the definition ultimately lies is if you can spend your time, how you choose doing what makes you happy and doing things that, that fulfill you personally, that is financial freedom. You're not Captain, bounded, you're not bounded by that constraint of money. Captain Rational, what does financial freedom look like to you? Optionality, which is, does uh, encompass what you're talking about, Ben. I want to be able to sit down in my place of business because I would like to contribute to organized labor. I want to do it in such a way that if I didn't want to sit down in that place of business, I could do it unimpeded. And I, you know, I had a taste of it over the last, uh, you know, two years and I'm still, I'm still there. And that's what makes me, that's what gave, give, that's the best expression of the sentiment I had when we first started talking because it's in jeopardy and it, it's still there, but it's like, come on, just, it was so close and it's, but it's still there, but it's that anxiety of loss of financial freedom because Damn it. And it has nothing to do with what most people think. Having an excess of wealth. Uh, clearly, you know, folks knew the extent. It's, it's very well off, but it has nothing to do with excess. It has to do with the balanced balance sheet and my capacity to have optionality to be fulfilled on a daily basis. And the second you're repressed or restrained with your capacity to make choices and decisions, that repression manifests as frustration. It is not fun to say, I want to get up from my place of business and find another place of business and not be able to. That's that. Well, that's indebtedness and that's a, a form of financial slavery, very obviously and probably inarguably. Um, so I still find myself in a place of relative content, threatened uh, for, for, uh, to be uh, uh, repressed uh, slightly based on conditions. Anyway, that's somewhat of an answer and as well as a story. A very good answer. And and the, the common thread between the two, in my opinion, is that there is the, the desire and the want for happiness. And happiness doesn't necessarily mean having extreme amounts of money. It's, it's about having what I believe, for, for me, what financial freedom looks like is peace of mind and peace of mind comes in many forms it's not about having excess amounts of money it's not about having the cool car or the things or it's such an interesting thing because it's such a subjective thing in terms of what ease of mind is for all of us you know whether it's like you say you know i've, I've i can see it i've tasted it i've felt it but I stand to lose it. And that's probably one of, well, not necessarily lose it, but it's going to probably be more difficult for me to 
attain it because you'll never lose it, dude. Like, trust me, you won't lose it. I know the anxiety to a huge part might not be founded. It's just that you've tasted and you've held it. And now you don't want to let it go because there's going to be a little bit of difficulty along the way. But trust me, it won't ever leave because that wisdom of knowing is way more valuable than a hundred million dollars or whatever that that number might be. So the happiness part comes from peace of mind and not necessarily making it in inverted commas. I'm f I've far from made it, but I'm doing what it is that I want to be doing. And for the most part, I'm actually really happy because like this pandemic shit came along and chaos broke out. And then next thing I knew I was in this thing that's blockmates and it's like, how did this actually happen? You know, like I get to like sit and talk shit with you guys, but like relevant shit for two hours and like have my mind blown and be just completely and utterly like I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Sure, there are times where I want to be out fly fishing on the flats in the Indian Ocean Islands and I want to be with my family surfing. But those moments happen and they will happen. And then I get to do this kind of stuff in between. And so do you guys. And and ultimately, even though we are in a really shitty market situation, we have wisdom to be able to go out there and, and go and fucking get what it is that we want. And that, sirs, for me, is probably the coolest damn fucking thing ever. <laughs> yep. I agree. I don't know I'll how I'm um, here either, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Definitely wasn't like this a couple of years back. Yeah. I just, as long as I could... Uh, I could value what I have in terms of an egg sandwich. <laughs> it's it's going to always it. come down to the Dude, I'm going to remind you about this egg sandwich when we hit the next bull market. I'm going to say, so how many egg sandwiches, dude? How many <laughs> egg sandwiches? <laughs> People talk about the price of their assets, and it's like, it's just, can't, they forget, can you go into a store and buy an egg sandwich with it? If you can't, it's irrelevant. It means nothing. Your asset may be priced in something. Who cares? Yeah. Anyway. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. I freaking really appreciate you guys. And yeah, what a cool, cool way to spend the last two hours. And here's to financial freedom. Pleasure. Cheers. We'll do it again. We always will. 